Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, number 26, from mid-November 2023. The surgeon is a general, Isidore S. Ravden. Welcome to the 26th episode of Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, an historic and active cemetery in Bala Kinwood, Pennsylvania. I am Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine from Temple University, volunteer tour guide, and volunteer podcaster. Laurel Hill West opened in 1869 across the river from its sister cemetery, Laurel Hill East in Philadelphia. It's more than twice as big as Laurel Hill East. It has a totally different feel and a strikingly different population. Like Laurel Hill East, it is open 365 days a year, now from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. There's plenty of parking at the business office just off Belmont Avenue or at the conservatory and bell tower. Another possibility, just come in while you're walking the Kenwood Trail. Your best bet for public transportation, take the R6 to Maniunk or a bus to the Wissahickon Transportation Center on Ridge Avenue. Then cross the Schuylkill River. You'll be leaving Philadelphia, coming into Montgomery County. You go across on the Pencoid Pedestrian Bridge, then walk up Writers Ferry Road to the entrance across from the Pet Cemetery. This 26th episode of Biographical Bites from Bala is for mid-November 2023. Isidore S. Ravden was a surgeon who trained at Penn and then spent his entire career there, except for the time he spent running an army hospital in the China-Burma-India theater and performing surgery on the United States president. He even appeared as a character in a popular comic strip of his day. You might recognize his name from the building that's named for him on the campus of the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. It is Isidore Ravden's story I will tell you today. There are many Laurel Hill connections with the surgical department of the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, or HUP. John Ray Barton, namesake for the first named chair of surgery in the United States, is interred at Laurel Hill East in the medallion section. The Agnew Dulles Building has nothing to do with a former U.S. vice president or a former secretary of state. It rather commemorates the great surgeon, David Hayes Agnew, whom I talked about in All Bones Considered Number 44, the James Garfield Connections, who's interred at Laurel Hill West, and horseman William Crothers Dulles, who went down with the RMS Titanic in 1912, and whose recovered body is interred at Laurel Hill East. His family donated the money for a pavilion to be named in his honor. But the main entrance to the massive medical complex, the place where you go for valet parking, is the Ravden Pavilion. About 60 years ago, less than two weeks after the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Dr. Isidore Schwainer Ravden put his signature on a cover letter to his dictated life memoirs. Under the heading Restrictions, this letter said, This memoir is not to be read, and that during my lifetime, no use of any kind whatsoever is to be made of it, except with my written permission. 
that when permission is granted, this memoir may be read, quoted from, and cited only by serious research scholars accredited for purposes of research by Columbia University. And further, that this memoir must be read in such place as is made available for purpose of research by Columbia University. That no reproduction of this memoir, whether in whole or in part, may be made by microphoto, typewriter, photostat, or any other device except by me, my heirs, legal representatives, or assigns. The signature is dated 5 December. 1963. Over the course of several sessions, starting in 1955, University of Pennsylvania surgeon I.S. Rabton, whom everyone called Rav, had dictated his life story. The transcript runs to more than 500 pages, double-spaced. It is a wealth of inside information about surgery in Philadelphia from the 1920s to the 1950s, and it is now freely available online in PDF format. It tells of a time of remarkable growth and development of American medicine, to which Ravden was a major contributor and knew most of the major players. Unlike the stereotypical academic surgeon, tall, rugged features, physically fit, no-nonsense personality. Revden was a 5-foot, 7-inch, paunchy chain smoker, rarely without a cigarette or a pipe when he wasn't in the operating room. He wore a bristly mustache most of his adult life. The first several minutes are Rev's story in his own words. I was born in Evansville in Vanderburg County, Indiana, on the 10th of October, 1894. My father and mother were both European in birth. My mother was born in Königsberg, Prussia, and my father was born in Riga, Latvia. They came over here in the early 1880s. My father had had training in optometry and used that profession as a means of supporting himself while going to medical school at Memphis, Tennessee. We were, you might call, a relatively poor family, but my mother always had a very real and abiding philosophy that the Lord would take care of her family. They rarely discussed financial matters with their children present. There was nothing unusual or outstanding in my youth. One of the great delights of my childhood was a horse, which was sent me one time from Price, Utah. The horse had never been broken in. And one of the great joys that my youngest brother and I had was to break this horse in, although I sustained a number of fractures of various bones from riding that horse. I think I learned a great deal about the care of animals as the result of taking care of Prince. My experience in high school was a very interesting one. My greatest interest was in history, and I had a teacher who to me was the epitome of what a teacher should be. She had the ability to teach history and interest even those who cared nothing about the subject. The area in which I was born was largely settled by Germans. Because of my mother, we as children learned a considerable amount of German, not only from the standpoint of facility to talk German, but a good background in German grammar and in German literature, so that by the time I went to high school, I was taking advanced German, and at the same time, I was taking part in certain of the German clubs that we had in that community. My father was far from being a teetotaler. He always had a drink of whiskey, bourbon whiskey, when he came home in the late afternoon. And from the time that I was a youngster, I was always offered that I might partake in part of this. By the time I suppose that I was 12 or 13 years old, I did have a little bourbon whiskey with him occasionally. It was during the last year of my high school experience that my youngest brother died following an operation supposedly done for appendicitis. He was somewhat different from the rest of my family in that he was quite tall and very dark-haired, in fact, black-haired, and the rest of us were blondes. He'd had some pain in his abdomen during the period that he played football in that year, and he went to a surgeon in Evansville 
who thought he had chronic appendicitis, a condition which we now know just doesn't exist. He was operated on on a Thursday morning and was dead on Saturday morning from peritonitis. In my senior year of high school, I was the business manager of the graduation volume, and I had through this achieved some knowledge of how such volumes were gotten together by printers and, of course, how they were financed. When I decided to leave home, I went to the printers who had printed this volume to ask them whether they might have a position for me in some other part of the country. They suggested that since they also printed religious monthly pamphlets for various churches around the country, I might go to some part of the country and attempt to develop some of these religious magazines for various churches in communities that they were not already operating in. This seemed to me a unique idea. And I left my home without telling my parents that I would do this and went to Memphis, Tennessee. While the work each day was interesting work, it was a time when all the hotels were filled with traveling men who traveled for various companies. They drank and gambled at night. And it was a rather difficult life as far as I was concerned. And as the spring came on, I kept getting more and more homesick. I decided that evening in Little Rock that I would go back to Evansville to see my father and mother. My mother, of course, was delighted to see me, but my father, who was somewhat of a tartar, when he came home that evening, asked me whether I had had enough and was ready to go to college. When I told him I didn't think I would go to college, he told me in no uncertain terms that I might just as well hit the road again. I thought it would be a very interesting thing if I went up to Bloomington to Indiana University just to see what it was like. My oldest brother was still there in school. I've come from a long line of doctors. My father's father was a doctor, my mother's father was a doctor, and my father's grandfather was a doctor. The only uncle that I knew was a doctor. My father was a doctor, my brother was studying for medicine. I had a deep feeling that I ought not to go into medicine, and I had a deeper feeling that if I went to college, perhaps I would drift into it. I stayed in Bloomington and took a very broad liberal arts course that spring. I remember there was a little Spanish, some German, some English, but I at first stayed away from the sciences. As we got into the latter part of spring, it seemed to me that I ought to attempt to make up the period of year that I had lost in not going to school, and I therefore decided that I would go to Winona Lake, Indiana, where the university had a biology station, and take some zoology. I lived in the Chautauqua area, and the rules and regulations were very strict ones. There was no drinking, no smoking. Lights had to be out at a certain time, and there was no dancing. Before I knew it, I was more or less trapped. I was spending an extraordinary number of hours in zoology, and then I asked to participate in a course Dr. Payne was giving in embryology. I was having a lot of fun there, I suppose a good deal of fun violating the rules of the Winona Chautauqua. Billy Sunday lived there in the summertime. If you don't know, Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player from 1883 to 1890. He spent his last season with the Philadelphia Phillies, but he left baseball when he felt the call of God. He became a preacher. He was the most influential American evangelist during the first two decades of the 20th century. Back to Ravden's narrative. I got to know Billy very well. It was not too long before I was arrested for smoking cigarettes within the Chautauqua. I went over to see Billy Sunday, and his first remark to me was, Well, you've been arrested, you're going to be thrown out of the Chautauqua area, and where are you going to live? Now, Rabden, I want to ask you one thing. What other sins have you committed here in Winona? I said, Billy, I've danced in Winona. He said, My God. God, you ought to be fried. I'll try to protect you at that meeting. Well, Billy knew that I had danced in the home of the superintendent of the Chautauqua, who was conducting my trial. 
He said he insisted that I must tell him where I had danced. The same minister who was head of the Chautauqua said, I don't think we ought to ask Mr. Ravden to tell us against his will. I'm sure he will never sin again, and I think we ought not to take any action against him. And that was the end of my troubles at Winona. And by the time I left Winona, I was perfectly convinced that I had better go into medicine. The World War then came along in the summer of 1914, and my father was again abroad. We were greatly concerned about my father because he was in Vienna at the time, and when the World War broke out, we weren't able to get any word from him. It was a fortunate circumstance that before he left, my mother was a bit uneasy about the situation in the world. I never quite realized why she was, but she sewed three or four $1,000 gold notes inside one of his vests, and it was through that money that he was able to get to London. We finally got word from him that he was in London and that he would attempt sooner or later to get back home. I never gave much thought to going to any other medical school than Indiana University School of Medicine. The first year, the work was given in Bloomington, so that there was no transition in moving from college to medical school. While the teachers in the first year were adequate from the standpoint of teaching ability, they were not, as a whole, men with broad vision or any other real background in research. Medical students in those days were rather rough youngsters, especially in my area of the country. Most of us chewed tobacco as we dissected cadavers, and all of us had a spittoon that we could spit into while we dissected. But one thing we did learn, and that was gross, gross anatomy. The year in medical school at Bloomington had passed so rapidly that I could hardly realize the time had come for us to go to Indianapolis. When I went to Indianapolis, I found myself in the throes of a busy, middle western city that was shabby and dirty. The medical school seemed to be merely an old barn. The laboratories were poor. The walls were whitewashed. My father, who had spent many months in graduate work in Boston, was convinced that the Harvard Medical School was the outstanding medical school, and I therefore write to Harvard to ask whether I might come to Harvard for my third and fourth years of training. It was with a great deal of joy that I finally got word from Harvard with a little brown book with a red number on it that I would be admitted to Harvard. I think I read more about the Harvard Medical School and its origin and the faculty at that time than perhaps any medical student ever did who had ever gone to that school. As the spring wore on, you may remember that our forces began to have difficulties with the Mexicans and their government and in particular with the man who I think was looked upon as a bandit at the time, Pancho Villa. I belonged to the Indiana National Guard, and the school year was hardly over, and I had hardly gotten home when I received orders to report to Fort Benjamin Harrison for induction into federal service. We spent a time at Fort Benjamin Harrison being indoctrinated. I was attached to Field Hospital No. 1, the commanding officer of which was a splendid psychiatrist whom I had known in the medical school. The time came, after a short period of training, to start for Texas. We were sent down in open vestibuled cars with cane seats to make a long trip, a slow train through Arkansas to Brownsville, Texas. None of us knew anything about Army life. I was a buck private. We were supposed to carry our food with us, which consisted of several bunches of bananas hung up in the baggage car, and a side of beef, which was covered with maggots by the time we got to Springfield, Missouri, where we threw it out of the baggage car. Our sustenance from then on consisted of sandwiches and coffee that people gave us at the various stations we got to. The organization of the Army was not what it is now. It was an extraordinary experience down there at the border. We got down in the rainy season. We were poorly equipped. We were in mud and water 
And although it might have discouraged some of the older people on duty and officers, the young people that were with me looked upon this as a most remarkable experience. We did a certain amount of training. Kornblum was down there with me and several of my classmates. I notified Harvard that I would not be able to come in the fall. And then the word went around that this struggle might last for some time and that medical students ought to be sent back to their medical schools. At that time, I had a really remarkable experience. Dr. Herrick, who was professor of medicine at Chicago, came down on an inspection trip. I had known him from visiting my father's house. And when I ran into him, he wanted to know what I was doing in the Army. I told him that I didn't see much sense in getting out of the Army, because I'd planned to go to Harvard, and school had started, and there wasn't any use now of doing anything except looking forward to going to Harvard the next year. He was shocked upon learning that I decided to go to Harvard, and he suggested that if I did not want to go to Chicago, I ought to go to the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I had never heard of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, knew nothing about it. But he was so firm in the fact that the Pennsylvania tradition was a fine one, that the more I thought about it, the more I became convinced, because of my deep affection for him and my abiding faith in his good judgment, that perhaps I'd made a mistake in thinking that I should go to Harvard. The next time I got into Brownsville, Texas, I sent a telegram to the dean at Pennsylvania. His name, of course, I didn't know. I told him I'd been accepted at Harvard. I told him I'd been accepted at Harvard, and that I had some reason to believe that I would get out of the Army, and would it be possible for me to come to Philadelphia if I got out? Several days later, I received a telegram which merely said, Come ahead. William Pepper. Dr. William Pepper was the provost of the University of Pennsylvania and the founder of the Philadelphia Free Library System. His larger-than-life statue is the one that greets you at the top of the stairs in the entrance hall of the main library at Logan Square. Ravden goes on for several dozen pages about his time at the University of Pennsylvania. He mentioned being from Jewish extraction when he talked about the fraternity, but he never again addresses his Jewishness in this large memoir. Now, Penn was at this time using a quota system to limit the number of Jews allowed into the medical school. Most med schools had settled on a maximum of 10%. One local school would only select two Italian Catholics per year no matter what their academic achievements were. Another school accepted one African-American student at a time. In other words, a black student would complete a four-year training, and only when he graduated would the school allow another black student in. While he was at Penn, Ravden learned surgery under three masters of the craft. John B. Deaver, Charles Frazier, and George Muller. They were rivals who rarely spoke to each other. Deaver, who was also interred at Laurel Hill West, probably has the most interesting story. Through his long distinguished career at the German hospital, which changed its name to Lankenau during the Great War, Deaver performed an estimated 15,000 appendectomies while contributing nearly 250 articles to the medical literature. He would perform as many as 25 surgical procedures in a day. Deaver's granddaughter, Sally Deaver Murray, who's buried in the same plot that he is, was an Olympic-quality alpine skier who was killed in the equestrian accident in 1963. She is a member of the International Skiing Hall of Fame, and I include her in the tour that I give of sports notables at Laurel Hill West. In 1921... I.S. Rabden married Elizabeth Glenn, a colleague and classmate at Penn. Elizabeth was born in Franklin, Pennsylvania, and she enrolled at Vassar College after high school. Before she graduated in 1915, 
she was involved in social justice issues and at one point joined fellow students in a feminist demonstration that led them to chain themselves to a fence at Vassar. She also participated in an early feminist march down Fifth Avenue in New York City. In 1919, Elizabeth had been chosen to be one of the first two women to complete their residency requirements at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. She served as assistant dean of the University of Pennsylvania's medical school from 1942 to 1945, while Rav was serving overseas. In 1927, the 33-year-old Ravden went abroad for a year of research, where he learned laboratory techniques and the value of collaborating with basic scientists. When he returned to Penn, he was appointed director of research in the surgery department. Over his first 14 years in charge, he averaged a publication every 30 days, more than 170 papers. He defined the capacity of the gallbladder to concentrate and alter bile. He reproduced syndromes of malnutrition in animals, which showed that hypoproteinemia delayed gastric emptying and impaired wound healing. And he began to study methods of nourishing patients who couldn't eat. In 1935, Philadelphia chemical manufacturer George Lieb Harrison died in his 100th year and was interred in the south section of Laurel Hill East. He left a bequest of $2.7 million to support basic science research at Penn. Ravden was now funded in his surgical research beyond his wildest dreams. He stimulated his colleagues and trainees to study shock, blood substitutes, surgical infection, antibiotics, and wound healing. Several of the department's projects would change care of patients around the world. John Gibbon, who worked in the Department of Surgical Research from 1935 to 1942, demonstrated in animals the feasibility of cardiopulmonary bypass. Ravden's own interest in nutrition culminated in the landmark report in the 1960s by Stanley Dudrick and colleagues on parenteral hyperalimentation, also known as TPN, Total Parenteral Nutrition. It was also in the 1960s that Adair Rogers and Kirkley Williams developed a fully implantable artificial heart. Oddly, at this time, there were two surgical services at Penn under different chairs. In 1936, Eldridge Eliason became Penn's senior surgeon and chair of the department. But Ravden also held a professorship, and he ran his own surgical service. These two services functioned autonomously. They selected and trained their own separate group of residents. Eliason was a technical virtuoso who encouraged his residents to concentrate on operative skills. Ravden trainees learned the science of surgery and they became the country's leaders in academic surgery. The money was a point of enmity between Eliason and Ravden, as Eliason had no access to the Harrison millions for his section. In 1940, when Ravden developed acute cholecystitis, the relationship between the rival surgeons further deteriorated when Ravden chose one of his trainees Jonathan Rhodes to perform his surgery, despite Ravden having summoned the great Alan Whipple from Columbia University. Eliason and Whipple were assistants to a man who had finished his residency only the year before. As was typical for him, Rav wanted to direct the procedure himself, which, since he was awake under spinal anesthesia, he began to do. Whipple is said to have exclaimed, Rav, scrub up or shut up. It was World War II that made Ravden's career. After his time in the Great War pursuing Pancho Villa with Black Jack Pershing and George Patton, he felt ready for anything. It was during that time that he learned to chew tobacco because on night patrol, cigarette smokers were more likely to get a sniper's bullet between the eyes. On 8 December 1941, 
the day after Pearl Harbor was bombed, Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson and Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox both contacted RAV to fly to Hawaii to report on the care being given the wounded. He carried with him a large supply of albumin, a jar of the new drug sulfonilamide, and a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey, none of which he feared would be readily available on the island. What he found, the care being given, was excellent. His next assignment was to recruit and staff an army hospital, largely from Penn personnel for the CBI, the China Burma India Theater. He would oversee the entire operation. Rev left his wife and three children behind at their 2015 Delancey Street home, and he placed Dr. Jonathan Rhodes, the man who had done his gallbladder surgery, in charge of the research laboratory at Penn. He took his unit to Lado, a town near the border of India near enemy-held Burma. This 20th General Hospital provided support for the Allies' impending invasion and control of Japanese-held North Burma, which was deemed indispensable for opening the Burma Road. This road was the only possible land route for supplying the Chinese army. Otherwise, supplies had to be flown with great risk and expense over the hump, the Himalayan mountains. Colonel Ravden arrived at the assigned hospital site during the monsoon season, and he found everyone knee-deep in mud and living in a few bamboo huts. Rav's administrative genius and ability to cut through army red tape were soon evident. Within a few months, his staff and some native recruits had somehow strung electric wires, dug drainage ditches, built roads and airstrip, a power plant, and dozens of buildings that soon accommodated a census of 2,500 patients. The 20th General Hospital was now a town. It occupied 40 acres, which Rabden described as the mayor. Ultimately, this hospital occupied 289 buildings, 162 tents, and in the 28 months of operation during Rabden's command, the hospital admitted close to 50,000 patients. General Vinegar Joe Stillwell, who was commander of the armed forces in the China-Burma-India Theater and regularly made rounds with Rav on Sunday mornings, described it as, quote, the best GD hospital in the Army. Now, spearheading the offensive in Burma was an elite group of volunteer jungle fighters under Brigadier General Frank Merrill. They were known as Merrill's Marauders, and they were often as much as a 100 miles behind enemy lines where their only supplies came from airdrops. Merrill's Marauders were a precursor to the LERPs, the long-range reconnaissance patrols. Crucial to their morale was that their wounded would be evacuated to the 20th General. In three months of action, the Marauders suffered a casualty rate of 80%, and on a single day, 63 of them were admitted to the 20th. Merrill himself was hospitalized twice. Merrill and Rav became lifelong friends, and it was Merrill who would deliver the star that would make Colonel Ravden the only general to command an overseas hospital in wartime. Ten years later, Rav got his second star and became the only person on non-active military service to be promoted to Major General. In appreciation for his long service, both in his role as a soldier and as a consultant, the military awarded him the Legion of Merit and an Oak Leaf Cluster to his Legion of Merit. When the war ended and General Ravden started for home, he was asked to succeed Eliason as Penn's chair of surgery. He accepted only on the condition that he become the one and only surgical chief. There was to be only one surgical service, and Ravden would call all the shots. He was also appointed as the John Ray Barton Professor of Surgery. 
following in the footsteps of other Laurel Hill West residents David Hayes Agnew and John Blair Deaver. Soon, he had become commanding general of the University Hospital and School of Medicine. Men who had worked with him in India were now the dean of the medical school, chairman of medicine, chief of neurosurgery, ENT, ophthalmology, plastic surgery, and thoracic surgery. His general's flag was always on his desk. The reputation of Penn Medicine and Ravden rose together. During his 15 years as chair, he received 11 honorary degrees and became an honorary fellow of five foreign surgical colleges. Rev frequently addressed Congress to encourage a commitment of increased funds and legislation in order to secure the future of medicine and medical research. On 9 June 1956, a national crisis brought Dr. I.S. Ravden to national attention. While he was chairing a meeting of the Board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons, Rabden was interrupted by a message that President Eisenhower was being admitted to Walter Reed Hospital and that the presidential airplane was being sent to fetch him. This is before the days of Air Force One. Rev had to leave mid-meeting, and he left Loyal Davis, M.D., Fellow of the American College of Surgeons, in charge. Loyal's daughter, Nancy Davis, had married actor and budding politician Ronald Reagan in 1952. On 8 June, Ike had entertained Bob Hope and Jane Powell at the White House. But shortly afterwards, he developed severe abdominal pains, followed by bilious vomiting. Eisenhower had no appendix, as he'd undergone an uneventful appendectomy in 1923. The month before this event, he'd been diagnosed with Crohn's disease, a condition the medical world was only starting to understand. After he examined the president, Ravden advised immediate surgery for bowel obstruction. At 2.20 a.m., Rav assisted Walter Reed's chief of surgery, General Leonard Heaton, and Eisenhower underwent successful surgery. Heaton and Rav had met at Pearl Harbor and Heaton would later serve as Surgeon General from 1959 to 1969. When they got into Ike's belly, they found 30 to 40 centimeters of thickened, indurated, contracted terminal ileum, but no active inflammatory bowel disease. Rather than resect the diseased bowel, they bypassed the obstruction with an ileocolostomy. Rev and Eisenhower became friends which increased his stature in the public eye. Photographs of him appeared in the newspapers with celebrities like Gregory Peck, Noel Coward, Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson, Pope Pius XII. In 1956, he was awarded the Philadelphia Award, one of the highest honors which can be given to a Philadelphian. Other winners you've heard me talk about, Leopold Stokowski, Catherine Drinker Bowen, Marian Anderson, Dr. Chevalier Jackson and Hilary Kaprowski, Sister Mary Scullion, many others whose names you would know. Now, while he was in the operating room, Rav was fast and sometimes unpredictable, impatient with his assistants, whom he sometimes banished or scolded for presumed infractions, only to reinstate them minutes later and praise them for reasons equally obscure. Outside the operating room, he was warm with a disarming sense of humor. His residents and faculty both loved him and feared him, and he protected and cherished them and used his tremendous political influence to foster their academic careers. Famed cartoonist Milton Kniff, author of the nationally distributed comic strip Steve Canyon, also became his friend. In October 1957, Rev showed up in a Sunday color comic strip as a brilliant clinician who was caring for Poteet Canyon, Steve's ward and distant cousin. She was being treated for the little-known condition at that time of anorexia nervosa. Kniff had met Rev during a trip to Philadelphia where he was supposed to give a talk for the Boy Scouts. He came down with a virus infection and was treated at Penn where he developed a friendship with the character known in the comic only as The Man. In 
but the illustration looks exactly like Isidore Ravden. After 15 years as department chair, Rav moved into the office of the university's vice president of medical affairs, where he concentrated on raising funds for buildings. One of the buildings was named the I.S. Ravden Institute. In 1959, he became responsible for all aspects of medicine at the university. This included dentistry, veterinary medicine, nursing, and all other allied medical fields. He was instrumental in reorganizing the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics at Penn. He was continually called upon for advice regarding applicants for top university medical posts, both at the university and elsewhere. Not only did Ravden make it his mission to build the University of Pennsylvania into one of the finest medical centers, but his ideas and professional consultation helped shape medical centers across the country. He was even active with other area hospitals, Graduate Hospital, Pennsylvania Hospital, Mercy Douglas, Jefferson, Temple. Rev and his wife Elizabeth were married for more than 50 years. They had three children together. Dr. Robert Glenn Ravden, 1923 to 1972, was with them in the family plot. Robert did his undergraduate work at Harvard and then went to medical school at Columbia. He was serving as chief of cancer chemotherapy at Penn when he suddenly died at a social event at the Union League when he was only 49 years old. Elizabeth Ravden Burgess, 1927 to 2007. She spent many years traveling with her husband, Donald Clayton Burgess, as he served as ambassador to several Middle Eastern countries. After Donald's retirement, Elizabeth served as a volunteer for the local fire department and became an EMT. William Dickey Ravden, 1928 to 2014. He attended Swarthmore before taking on an administrative job with Smith Klein and French, pharmaceutical giant. He also served as president of the Board of Trustees for People's Light, the professional nonprofit theater company in Malvern. Although medicine was at the heart of Ravden's life, he actually made time for civic activities. He served as trustee and benefactor to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Rosenbach Foundation. He established the Ventner Foundation to bring German doctors to the United States for training. He enjoyed a lifelong relationship with the Meet Johnson Company in Evansville, Indiana, and served as its director and as a member on its scientific advisory board. It seems implausible that Revdom had any time for personal interests, but he developed hobbies and he pursued sports. His chief sport was deep sea fishing. His hobbies included the collection of Civil War Revenue Department stamps. His most prized stamps were those purchased from the collection of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And Rev and Elizabeth grew all varieties of holly including English, Japanese, and Chinese holly at their second home in Bucks County. Isidore S. Ravden died only a few months after his oldest son on 27 August 1972. He was so loved and respected that his memorial services were conducted in the Irvine Auditorium on the Penn campus. He was laid to rest in the Skytop section of Laurel Hill West. That's across Writers Ferry Road from the bulk of the cemetery. Elizabeth outlived him by 12 years. She died in 1984. And now if you go to the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, you will more than likely enter the building through the Ravden Wing on 34th Street.
December episode of All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 57, is called Murder Most Foul. I and a few of my fellow guides will read you newspaper articles about murder victims who found their final resting place at Laurel Hill. Whether they were shot, stabbed, pushed, or poisoned, their stories will make you shake your head in wonder at how things have changed and how they have stayed the same. In Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, episode number 27, I will tell you of an old soul guitarist who followed in the footsteps of primitive guitarist John Fahey, Robbie Bashow, and others. After he switched from electric to acoustic, he recorded more than a dozen albums on various labels, which led to a critic for Pitchfork magazine saying, Finally, somebody has something to say on the acoustic guitar that hasn't been said before. He died tragically young of a heart attack before his 40th birthday. He's interred in the green burial section at Laurel Hill West. I remind you there are self-guided tours available for both cemeteries. For Laurel Hill East, download the app. For Laurel Hill West, well, you can find it with your podcast. There's a walkthrough from the Kinwood Trail entrance to the Pencoid exit and another in the opposite directions. If you do the round trip tour, it's about two hours of stopping at stones, peeping in mausoleums, and hearing about nearly 100 people who helped make Philadelphia what it is today. All Bones Considered and Biographical Bites from Bala are mostly researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine from Temple University, volunteer tour guide, and volunteer podcaster for both cemeteries. You can reach me through my email, joe at joelex.net. The theme song, Names at Peace, is by local artist James Harrow. Maybe I will see you on a tour. Stay safe, stay well. Stay tuned if you want to hear my references for this show. The biggest help in the early life of Isidore Revden was definitely his reminiscences that he dictated for the Oral History Research Office of Columbia University. 1971 is the date on it, although he dictated between 1955 and 1962. I found this online in the Columbia University archives. There's an article called A Review of the Late General Eisenhower's Operations, Epilogue to a Footnote in History. That is from the Annals of Surgery, May 1971, Volume 173, Number 5. The authors on that are Drs. Hughes, Baugh, Malone, and Leonard Heaton. An article called The Jewish Problem in U.S. Medical Education, 1920 to 1955. Author is Edward C. Halperin. Source, Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, April 2001, Volume 56, Number 2, pages 140 to 167. And then a nice tribute from Jonathan E. Rhodes, My Teacher and Chief, I.S. Ravden. It is from Surgery. It's a little small article. It's only two pages long. It was published in 2000. It's volume 127 of Surgery, pages 584 and 585. Then there are two articles that I got from the Penn Surgery Society publication. The first is called Recalling I.S. Ravden, 1894-1894. To 1972. It's the fall 2013 edition, pages 3 through 7. Lots of good information in that. Also from the Penn Surgery Society, a 2011 article about William T. Fitz Jr., F I T T S, where he talks about the time that he trained with Ravden. Finally, for general information on education, Two books from my own collection, The Education of American Physicians, Historical Essays, edited by Ronald L. Numbers. That is from the University of California Press, 1980. Then there's The Social Transformation of American Medicine by Paul Starr, another classic text 
about medical education. This was published by Basic Books Incorporated out of New York, copyright 1982. Interestingly, the transformation of American medicine, the education of American physicians, and the Penn Surgery Society all use the same picture on their cover. It's the Agnew Clinic by Thomas Eakins. Thanks for listening. Stay safe. Stay well.